Um, I have a question for Kier, or better to say, a request for his opinion. Um, among the heretical movements, uh, I am very interested about the Anabaptists, and I'd like to know your take about this very interesting episode of European history. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, the, I didn't mention the Anabaptists because I was running out of time and I was trying to focus primarily on the medieval heretics. Um, the Anabaptists, I think, can be understood as a development of the Hussites, um, or at least very strongly connected to them. Um, they were German heretics who were uh, particularly prominent um, around the Rhine and in, uh, in particular, Munster, where they, they, they controlled the government at one point and, and expropriated um, a lot of property. Um, they, they were much more radical than most of the other Protestants, much more akin to some of the more radical medieval heretics. Luther, for instance, had no sympathy uh, for, the, for the Anabaptists. Um, but yes, there was definitely a, a connection between the, uh, between the Anabaptist uh, Protestants and the Hussite medieval heretics. Thomas Munster had, had, visited, uh, the, had, had, had visited Prague uh, in the 1520s and um, built up a sort of network and made some Hussite connections. And one of the Hussite is, uh, ideas um, which was held in common with, with other heretics. Um, I think they got it from John Wycliffe, and who knows uh, further in the past. One important idea which is obviously um, inimical um, to, to, to libertarianism and, uh, and propertarianism, if you like, is the idea of dominion by grace. The idea that secular and spiritual authority or power, and also the, even the ownership of property and private wealth, should only be allowed to those who were judged to be in a state of grace, to only those who were, if you like in modern terms, judged to be virtuous. And these people, um, the, these uh, late medieval heretics and these um, early modern Protestants, how did they judge this? Well, they had translated the scriptures for themselves, and, and uh, so they, they equated God's law, doing good with whatever they decided to find in the Bible, and, um, and they associated it with all kinds of ideas which we would consider as socialistic, um, or even uh, national socialistic today. And, uh, and they acted on these ideas. There were revolutions and rebellions and expropriations um, across Germany and elsewhere. Uh, there's definitely a, a strong connection between bad ideas and bad practice. And so that, that I think, would, would be, um, th those would be my few um, words on, on, the, on the, uh, the Anabaptists. Brazilian experts here. Um, what, uh, what, I'm, I'm curious about the fu economic future of Brazil. Um, like how how is the currency stability and the bank credit cycle uh, play out in the Brazilian economy? And had, had, what do you see in the future? Is it, is it going to grow? Is it a growing country or? A you know, when we talk about Brazil or Latin America, you never know where the bottom line. It always can be down. But uh, for the first time, I, I can feel a different feeling because. Not because Brazilian became more smart, uh, became smarter or, or more intelligent, but by lucky, uh, our business cycle, the bus came before the rest of the world. So uh, I see the uh, Europe and, and America, they are about to get in crisis, and Brazil had it before, so it has to start its reforms before everyone. Ev everyone. So when the crisis strikes the rest of the world, Brazil might be in the right track before everyone. So I am a little bit optimist. Uh, our prime minister, our financial minister from Bolsonaro government, he's not exactly an Austrian, but he's from Chicago 
and he's doing some what is supposed to do. He is privatizing companies, he is uh, lowering the, the, the government debt, and for the first, uh, deregulating, which is some amazing, it's unthinkable. A, f a few years ago, talk about what this guy is talking or doing, in, in fact. So we are in the political struggle because he, the government hasn't the majority on, on the Congress and the laws has to be negotiated. We all know what this is all about, but I'm a little bit optimist, yes. Also relatively optimistic about uh, what is going on. It has been a, a big change, yeah, a drastic change. Yeah, the whole political system has uh, taken up a new orientation and compared to what has been going on over the past 30 years, uh, it is an orientation towards free market, even some libertarian elements in it, uh, in, in the group. They just uh, published a statement uh, uh, about uh, uh, free markets. And so it's, it's actually a revolution happening. And my impression also is that <clears throat> with this is going on a change of intellectual climate, which is very important. Up to now, it was totally in the hands of whoever, whatever one may call it, the leftists or Marxists or communists and so on. And the youth, in my opinion, is about to make a U-turn and uh, adopt and, and, and at least to get interested in, in libertarian free market ideas. Yeah? And uh, in the, the political system, however, still is full of the old mechanisms. No? They are, ten the tendencies are still there. So uh, the new president cannot just uh, go on as, uh, and his finance minister and economics minister as, as they would probably like to because they depend on coalition work. The problem is to understand. Uh, <clears throat> in Europe, we usually have parliamentary system in the US, you have the presidential system, and in Brazil, this is totally mixed. So you neither have a clear presidential system nor a clear parliamentary system. Yeah? And this makes things extremely difficult. So uh, uh, things that are rare, uh, 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 even, even uh, uh, initiating impeachment, are relatively easy in, in Brazil. It is almost like in a parliament, like it happened in, in Britain recently, you can get a new prime minister by, by the parliament. You don't need a new election. So this is the mixed up. So uh, it depends very much on the on the political quality of, of Bolsonaro no? to, to make to play the game to play the game and we still have to see uh, in how much how much he, he can do that and uh, without losing uh, the the direction that's that's the problem not that you fall back into corruption now there's this privatization coming up and what I've heard many of the politicians say, we support it, yes, but they expect to get part of the cake. So these games uh, make it difficult to give a clear signal that things are turning to the, to the good. But generally, I, I think also this way. The case of Venice is far more famous than the case of Genoa. Uh, how would you describe the main difference between these two republics. Um, and in addition, is there some event that can be identified that um, led to the change in Genoa from that old system to being part of a general state? And let me add, just add another question to, uh, to Tony. How representative is the selection of uh, Christie and Rankin? Um, I'm not a great uh, mystery novel reader. Uh, I mean, these could be just accidents, so to speak. Do you have 
any idea if you would find that, let's say, if you look at the American mystery writers or uh, mystery writers from other places where you would see similar changes in the course of time? Concerning the first question, I would say that the two systems are quite radically different. Um, and uh, this is true when you compare not only Genoa with Venice, but Genoa with other city republics in, in Italy. Very often you see the same institutions in Genoa and in other cities. So at the superficial level, it's, it seems that Genoa is following a certain pattern during the high Middle Ages and the late Middle Ages concerning its constitutional development. But actually, when you uh, look at the powers that these institutions had in Genoa, you almost unavoidably find significant differences. So for example, the, uh, the figure of the Podesta, which is uh, uh, quite widespread at, at some point in, uh, uh, during the High Middle Ages across uh, Northern Italy, was a sort of foreign judge called in to solve the disputes within a state, within a city-state, among different families and different factions. Um, which will uh, uh, seem to match uh, libertarian theory in, in the sense of private arbitration and calling in a judge that uh, has the trust of both parties or of, or, or, or of several parties. Um, and yet, when one looks at the Podesta in Genoa vis-a-vis -vis the Podesta in other city-states, uh, one immediately notices some differences. So, for example, in Genoa, uh, the Genoese uh, called the Podesta only for one year, and they lay down a series of conditions that the Podesta has to respect. Right, also other cities are doing the same, but in the other cities, the Podesta is more of a step towards the centralization of power, whereas the Genoese are making sure that the Podesta can only help the weaker faction in case that the strongest one, that the stronger one uh, plays the role of an aggressor. So for instance, uh, very often the contract signed by the Genoese assembly with this foreigner who comes in is, okay, you come in for one year, you bring a dozen of your judges to spread across our territory and uh, 20 to 60 men in the sense of soldiers. Now, that was not enough for these men to take over the entire uh, city. But it was just enough to have at that time 20 or 60 uh, professional soldiers to tip the balance in favor of the, uh, uh, of the party that had been uh, uh, subject uh, to aggression by another party within the city. And there are many of these examples. So another, another institution later on is the institution of the Sindacatori, which you find in different uh, cities across Italy. The Sindacatori are uh, men who are supposed to check that the constitutional order is respected. Now, what's interesting is that in Genoa, the syndicatory have more powers, and they can prosecute officers of the Republic who have misbehaved, uh, not only after they have done so, but also during their term of office. I'm trying to uh, summarize a few of, the, of, of these differences. So, Genoa is a unique example. Uh, concerning Venice, uh, Venice is one of the most militaristic uh, republics. Um, a difference that may be of interest is the difference uh, in the commercial expansion, in the imperialistic expansion of, of, of Venice vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, the Genoese one. Uh, the Venetian government directs the, uh, the Venetian military expansion into the Adriatic, and into uh, the Levant, and in northern Italy itself, there is a, a large territorial expansion. On the other hand, Genoa uh, is not engaged in a territorial expansion. It doesn't build a territorial state in northern Italy. And the Genoese colonies across the Mediterranean and beyond are uh, formed in a more spontaneous or disorganized manner. There isn't a public arsenal. Uh, there isn't a public policy, uh, a cohesive policy of, of the Senate to direct this expansion. Um, now, uh, the second question was about the, the time in which Genoa starts to lose this tradition. That's a bit uh, uh, tricky. 
I, as, I have, as I was preparing this paper, I, I realized that this war of 1625 is really impressive because it's very late and still Genoa has, uh, uh, is using a variety of non-state means to resist aggression and it does so quite effectively. Um, after this, the public expenditures go up and some of the, uh, the, 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 um, the pressure from also from allies, such as Spain, uh, are important to consider. Um, but uh, I would say that Genoa remains a, a republic without really a large public with a large standing army until the very end, until uh, um, its, its destruction in, in, uh, uh, in the 18th century. So I, I hope that this addresses the, the question. Uh, So-called golden age of English detective fiction, uh, which actually uh, Agatha Christie was a representative example of it. Uh, and many other books have the same kind of atmosphere where uh, the typical murder is, uh, shall we say, a vicar uh, in the library of a country house where, of course, murders don't actually happen. Um, uh, and I think there has been a brutalization in general of uh, such novels. Um, not, it's not just Rankin, but many of them, uh, they're disturbing because they often involve people being cut up and, and put in sewers or things like that, or children uh, 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 abused and then killed. And uh, actually, uh, uh, George Orwell wrote a famous essay called The Decline of the English Murder, um, in which he complained that we no longer have the kind of refined uh, murders of the past. He called it the golden age of English murder, which was lasted from about 1850 to um, 1940, uh, when petty bourgeois uh, people or, uh, or um, very religious people uh, would kill um, their wives, usually by poison, and um, or alternatively there was the brides in the bath, uh, a man who got his, uh, his wives, uh, he, he, he married many people at the same time, and uh, he drowned three of them in the bath. And on one occasion, he, he played the organ, and after he drowned, the, uh, drowned his so-called wife, of course he was not legally married to her, he did it for the insurance money, uh, he played near uh, uh, an English hymn, Nearer My God to Thee. <laughs> uh, well, that was the kind of murder we all loved in England, but uh, George Orwell said we were going over to a much more brutal kind of murder in reality, uh, and this has been reflected actually in the detective fiction. So there are some writers who still try and write the village murder, but it's very, in my opinion, it's unconvincing because that world has disappeared uh, completely. Uh, but on the whole, uh, murder stories have become much more brutal, not just, uh, and Rankin is a good social commentator, um, and I think it's true in America as well. And now other countries, I don't know. You made mention that Genoa was rejection of Machiavellian principles, and certainly looking at the prince, we can agree with that. Yet he also wrote in The Art of War that you should not rely on mercenaries or on a bureaucratic military or even entangling alliances, and in fact agi agitated for a militia, a very robust militia system. So perhaps you can comment or contrast what Machiavelli is talking about with a militia system with what we saw in Genoa. Yes, the, the, the militia system that he had in mind was completely different. It was uh, a more centralized system under the authority of the state and he himself participated in the creation or in the attempt to create something like that uh, for the Florentine Republic. Usually Machiavelli has a very statist view of what, of a very modern view of the state. Um, the state is um, sovereign and it is a machine ready for, that must be ready for war in order to survive. Machiavelli also has a distaste for private wealth. Um, I'm, I'm obviously making a long story short, but Machiavelli has a distaste for private wealth, um, which is quite at odds with 
uh, Genoese values. What you see in Genoa is a celebration of entrepreneurship and of wealth in the majority of the cases, obviously. Um, there are poems from the 15th century in Genoa where the anonymous Genoese merchant and entrepreneur is celebrated uh, rather than uh, uh, the statist, rather than, than, uh, uh, than the great public uh, servant or, or, uh, or military leader. So in general, um, Genoa continued to represent a model of pre-modern state in contraposition to uh, the Machiavellian revolution uh, for quite a while. Now, interestingly, Machiavelli has a passage uh, in which uh, he comments on, uh, um, on the situation in Genoa, and he complains about the fact that the comune, so the state government, is very weak, it's corrupt, it's disorganized, and, and then he points out, oh, look at what instead the Bank of St. George is doing, uh, so rational, so organized, so strong in its own laws and arms. Um, if only the entire republic were taken over by uh, the Bank of St. George, then uh, what a great republic that Genoa uh, would become, which is, of course, missing the entire point of, uh, uh, of the medieval um, uh, jurisdictionally uh, diverse system that Genoa still represented. So in, ge in, so in, in general, Machiavelli is indeed uh, with, with its own um, new ethics, which has been uh, um, described by some as, as, as an anti-Christian ethic, really, um, surely uh, as an anti-medieval uh, ethic, uh, an ethic that is, that is, Machiavelli is one of the first writers, in other words, that creates a different sets of, uh, set of rules for the state. So the rest of people, uh, the, the rest of us um, have to abide to certain rules, but the state is different, right? So um, in, in this sense, um, Genoa is a contradiction. Uh, it stands in contradiction to, to the Machiavellian uh, um, standard, to the, Machiavelli, to the Machiavellian recipe, we, we could say. Uh, Brazil is known as a multiracial or multi-ethnic um, country, and um, you've, you've clearly shown that the states which are predominantly white are also the ones who are predominantly the wealthiest. But the question is, how is the division of wealth in, within the state? Is there a big difference in wealth between the, the ethnicities, the races, and how does this re reflect uh, political life or social life in Brazil? Uh, is there affirmative action? Is there programs? Is there um, demands for reparations like we hear in the United States, et cetera, et cetera? Can you comment, please? Uh, I, I will give my uh, historical personal example. Uh, my forefather came from Italy, poor as the poorest guy in the world. And in, in less than one generation, all the Italians became rich. So when I showed the, 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 the syndicates and the union in, in, in Sao Paulo get stronger, it means that the Italian workers and industrialists, they became rich and they became what today is the midi middle class and the richest class. And, and it's obvious a, a, a racial difference because we are white, uh, not for a German, but for a, a, a Brazilian, <laughs> Brazilian standard. We are white and, and, and the black people never could do this, the, the same or the mixed people because there is not actually a, a, a big contingent of black per, per se. They are more, much more a, a mixed country and a mixed pe people. And the productivity of the immigrants from Germany and Italy was higher when, we, when, when our forefathers arrived there and we got rich uh, much before then even started to be a productive industrial worker workforce. And it makes a difference inside Sao Paulo state, which the, is the, the biggest uh, contributor to the gross domestic, domestic product. Uh, and, and yes, you know, uh, but we never had in Brazil uh, a racial problem. It's an American imported uh, democratic byproduct. And, and now it's a problem like the ridiculous uh, uh, numbers that Professor Miller pointed out in a university that, that 
83 Negroes are harmed in Brazil in one minute. <laughs> and, and, and it's causing a problem because who wants to, to hire for the same salary a guy who the productive is, is much lesser than the other? And we are all schooled in, in Austrian economics, and we know how 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 the start how the started it became uh, the intention to help the poor uh, ends to harm there, and that's why the Brazilian system make the poor poorest and the rich richest. Because I live in the other part of Brazil, in the poor part, in, in generally speaking. And uh, there you have uh, the old established class uh, who nowadays uh, get rich because uh, the forefathers, uh, usually of, of uh, uh, Portuguese descent, uh, were landowners. No? And they, they also are these groups uh, who uh, are very active in all uh, the politics uh, and their political interest is uh, not so much any kind of ideology but being at the place where for example <clears throat> new land areas are opened for building and uh, this is the way uh, how you can get rich in the Northeast, especially at the coast, uh, not just a little bit rich, but really uh, rich, because you can imagine how this land uh, val gets values when, when it's uh, for, for a lot of kind of uh, uh, gated communities uh, that, that, that there are that are there uh, along with tourist uh, places. Yeah, that, that's one, 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 one part. <clears throat> the other part, <clears throat> especially uh, from, from the state where, where I am, what I can observe the other way uh, to, get, to get wealthy uh, or to stay wealthy uh, is to have a solid education, usually, however, in law, uh, uh, not in business, not in engineering, not in chemistry, but in law. And then you manage it to get into a kind of official position. And the discrepancy between, let's say, private activities, even activities which, for example, in, in Europe are well paid, engineering and so on, yeah, you get in Brazil an outrageous salary. Uh, so, for example, to become a public persecutor or a judge uh, and all this kind of type, uh, especially if your wife also uh, works in this area, means that you can expect salaries of up to a million reais per year. It's outrageous. It's absolutely uh, unbelievable what is happening. Uh, how kind of a high salaries the top public servants earn. Yeah, And when one contrasts th this to the average people, that in the Northeast usually have no, no, no way to go because there's hardly any industry, yes? And uh, those are small shopkeepers, uh, people that have an auto repair shop, etc. They have a terrible life in terms of paying taxes, of being persecuted through regulations and so on. So one can put it this way in the Northeast, different from Sao Paulo, you get rich yeah, by not working, yes? And you get punished when you do something productive. When you are able to get in the public service in Brazil and become a public employee, a government employee, you abolish the law of scarcity. There is no problem anymore in your life you're gonna have a, a huge salary, uh, even even after your retirement. 
uh, it's granted the same salary when you were uh, uh, in, in activity. So there is no more scarcity in your life. Just one question also for the Brazilians. Um, what role does this, these Pentecostal churches play? I hear that they, they have an increasing influence. Uh, Bolsonaro belongs also to this group. And how do you explain the rise of the Pentecostal religion and the, dec and the parallel decline of Catholicism? Yeah, I, I I talk a little bit about that in my my presentation, but it's 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 a it's a deep question and deserve uh, close attention. And one point is that the the disfiguration of the urban scenario that uh, we lost that balance, the priest per capita that used to be very equal in all country, and when the migration happens. Uh, the, the, the church uh, does not follow the same velo uh, velocity of the, the change in urban scenario in Brazil. So now the new Pentecostal uh, and the evangelical uh, denominations, they, are, they, they grow a lot. In Rio de Janeiro, or, um, we, which is uh, 20 million inhabitants, they are half of the, the, the believers. And it's a big yes. It's a big change in in, in Brazilian scenario, but uh, it's it's it, it, like the the racial question. It's an American product, like those uh, evangelical celebrations about the prosperity, uh, uh, faith, and they are very influent. They already has the the, 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 the one of denominations has the the, the third largest television broadcast in Brazil, and it's very influent, while the Catholic uh, is, uh, is one local television, and they are gaining space, money, and uh, political influence. They elected more than 10% of our Congress, and they are uh, a political power in, in our country right now. And uh, you know, uh, the, the first thing, when Bolsonaro got the, 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 when the result of the elections got out and Bolsonaro was elected, was an evangelical prayer with their, his evangelical supporters. His wife is an evangelical believer. So it, 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 it says a lot when, you, when Bolsonaro represents, it's a symbolism, because Bolsonaro is a military. So this time they are the military came to power by election for the first time. And the symbolism of it is that he represents the original Republican project, which is a fight against the Catholic monarchy. The first Republicans in Brazil, they incentivate other faiths to come here. So Lutherans from America, from all, all American denominations, but it came to Brazil in this beginning of the Republic. So Bolsonaro seems like a, a, a return to the original project of the Brazilian Republic. I looked at this phenomenon with great interest and with the eyes of an economist. And uh, the economist always uh, um, sees supply and demand. And uh, what I uh, thought uh, to, 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 to see uh, uh, as an explication, uh, these groups have a good offer. Yes, they offer social integration for all kinds of people. They are open to anybody. Yes, and so you, uh, a little bit different from the Catholic Church, where you are Catholic, uh, probably uh, usually by birth or, or, or by family, and then you use the church more or less for certain days, for certain celebrations and so on. And otherwise, uh, over the past decades, many people have become aloof uh, from, from this tradition. But what they long for is a community. Now, now, when you belong more to intellectuals, so you may choose some kind of club or something like that, or, or uh, 
uh, this gun, but for the, for the ordinary normal people, uh, there, there is a desire uh, to join, uh, to have a social environment. And, and in this sense, uh, these, these evangelicals uh, offer really a, a, a good product where, where, they, where they have their, they call it cults. Uh, and, and they take care of the children there, they, they have musical uh, 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 teaching, yes, they have own bands, they have own music, yes, so also for the, it's almost uh, like also bringing in uh, your whole family, and I think this, is, this makes the attraction. In addition to that, there's also a kind of, uh, ideological difference uh, as you've mentioned I think that that's right they they are worldlier in this respect evangelical Lutheran uh, in, in the traditional Calvinistic let's better call it Calvinistic that is they open up the path uh, it's okay to get rich yeah while the Catholic Church from a certain tradition admires more uh, staying poor and and not, not favoring that so much. So they favored this idea to get rich, to be modern, uh, uh, and uh, at the same time offer something, coziness, community, where I belong to, where I can go to anytime I want to. There are groups there and so on. And the uh, religious aspect that is there fits well into the, it's a, not a different religion in, in terms of Christianity. It belongs to the whole area of Christianity. So even when you grow up, grew up as a Catholic, you are not uh, 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 converting to a totally different religion. You just uh, make a few, few changes and you find a new home. I think uh, that's what I, what I found out uh, to explain this phenomenon have to add something because um, it's a shift that happens in the Catholic Church not in only Brazil but in whole South America you know uh, in the co during the Cold War the South America had dictatorships in the, in major countries like Argentina Uruguay Chile Brazil also and the Catholic Church always had a conservative side in these countries and supported much of these, uh, these, these military dictatorships in all America. Then the left discovered that the Catholic Church has important role in our society. And that, then where it comes the Teologia da Libertação, liberation theology, I don't know if that uh, Pope Hatzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, when he was Cardinal Hatzinger, he went to I think Nicaragua or Guatemala to to ask the uh, I don't know how to to say in English but to ask the silence the silent to a a, 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 a a clergy that was creating the the the, the all, f all spreading this liberation theology all through the Latin America so it's a shift because the Catholic Church became to support all left uh, uh, ideology during the 60s and when it reached the 90s it's it's already taken from the catholic uh, from the left side and the catholic church supported uh, the, the last 30 years of left government in brazil and and did not support bolsonaro at all even bolsonaro being with a lot of uh, anti-gay anti-abortion or a conservative agenda the catholic church was not with him in the last election so it's, it's a shift that happens in the last 40 or 50 years even when the left discovered the, the, the importance of Catholic support and, and infiltrated in, in its lines with the theology of liber liberation. I don't know if, if you are acquainted of, of this term. Thank you. If I could just mention two, uh, two of my experiences. One was in the slums of Birmingham and the other was in Guatemala. And I saw in Birmingham uh, the rise of the same kind of churches. And uh, I went to see them and I thought they, of course, I went uh, thinking this is ridiculous. But what I saw was that these, that these churches answered something for these people whose lives without it were so sordid that this offered them something much, much better. In Guatemala, 
the church, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the evangelicals, whom I detested uh, personally, I thought, you know, it's uh, aesthetically terrible. Uh, oh, I don't. <laughs> aesthetically disgusting. Uh, they would go around and saying, you can do something in your life. If you do what we say, you will be rewarded. And unfortunately, well, I don't know whether you think it's unfortunate or fortunate, what they were saying was true. Because if their people did convert, they stopped drinking so much, they stopped beating their wife, they started uh, looking after their children, they went and worked their fields. Whereas uh, the, uh, the Catholics were concentrating on political action. So they were able to tangibly improve uh, the, the lives of uh, very poor people. Uh, which the Catholics uh, didn't because they were waiting for everything to change before anything could change. And these people were offering hope to individuals and they actually bribed them as well. I mean, there was straightforward bribery. The Catholic Church in, the, in this era lost this role to the evangelical churches and new Pentecostal churches. That, that's that's the, the point. They they just lost lost contact with the real people, and and that's why I don't I, I don't buy the the, the 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 speech that oh Francis is a communist pope no, he's an import he has an important role because he is uh, uh, how how do I mean uh, uh, a parish pope, a local pope, that's what he he represents in in this sense he he say things to real people, uh, it's not exactly the, that he provides what the people want, because it's a, a totally perversion of religion is all about. Uh, God doesn't have to please us, it's the opposite. We have to please God. That's what uh, we are here to, 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 to praise God, not uh, the, the opposite. So uh, I see uh, Francis as um, oh yeah, he says some stupid thing about economics all the time. It's not that easy. He's from Argentina, and you know, all all the Brazil Argentina rivalry. But in some sense, he's not that bad. And I would like to put some more thought about that when I make it more coherent. In this sense, that he he tries to come back to the the real people to this connection that the Catholic Church lost, and lost big. Quite beautifully contrasted the fictional worlds of Christie and um, uh, Rankin? Rankin? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, and how uh, crime, etc., is portrayed in those novels and how it reflected, to a certain extent, the reality of the various eras. So kind of the social disarray and the corruption of the police force in Rankin's world and um, the kind of the cushy villages and upper middle class life in kind of 20s, 30s England with evil crime sort of below the surface. But um, to what extent do you um, agree that this does reflect the reality in England um, of on the one hand social collapse, but I really wanted to ask you about um, police forcing. So for example, there's been a lot of, I guess, controversy, especially in recent years, um, with high profile cases in London and other urban areas in the UK to do with stabbings, terrorism, um, and how, especially since the Blair era, there was kind of the idea of we're going to be tough on crime, but tough on the causes of crime. So kind of the evolution of criminal justice into being kind of more um, altruistic and rehabilitative um, rather than punitive, which is shown shorter sentences, etc. How is this to what extent do you agree with me that this is true, that there's been a decline in the police force and this has had an impact on crime in the UK? Um, also, social factors have affected it, but to what extent do you agree with that and how it's reflected in the culture? And also, does the solution lie in harder policing um, with the government or is there a solution outside the state? Um, I guess I'm talking about Britain specifically, but feel free to give other examples. <laughs> 
policing and the criminal justice system in Britain is, is uh, very feeble, actually. Um, there are two, I think one should always try and um, uh, distinguish between primary prevention and secondary prevention. Secondary prevention is how do you get people not to be criminals in the first place? And second, secondary prevention is what you do with criminals once they have become criminal. Uh, and the two things are related, but they're not exactly the same. We have a very, very lenient uh, criminal justice system, uh, which no doubt encourages people to, to be violent, for example. So that if you look at the number of prisoners, we often hear in Britain, for example, that we have a high number of prisoners uh, per capita compared with other Western European countries. Now, I, I, I will ask you, does anyone see what's wrong with that statistic? It's an absurd statistic because, just do a, a thought experiment, if there had been no crime ever committed and there was one prison, one prisoner, that would be an outrage against justice. So it's not a question of how many prisoners you, you have per head of population. It's the relation of the prisoners to the number of crimes committed. And if you look at Spain, for example, Spain has roughly the same number of prisoners per head as Britain, roughly, uh, but there are six times more violent crimes in Britain than in Spain. Britain has by far the highest rate of criminal, of criminal violence in Europe. Uh, and you can actually show that this followed uh, the, gradual, uh, the gradual leniency of the judicial system, such that, for example, in 1900, we had uh, six imprisonable offenses per prisoner. We now, in 2000, we had 114. So that, but clearly, uh, you don't want a society uh, to be well ordered only because there is a policeman around the corner and if you do anything wrong, he's going to stop you. Uh, now, if you ask me, how do you uh, do the primary prevention of, of, um, of crime, uh, I'm not sure, uh, but... Uh, I have in the past suggested that one of the principal causes of crime is criminology. <laughs> and, and this is only half, I'm, only, I'm being only half facetious, but I, uh, we're almost through so I can't explain why I think that criminology has actually contributed enormously to crime, at least in Britain. Yeah, Cristiano, you mentioned that the rise of Pentecostalism and, uh, and evangelical is not a purely sorry it's not a purely brazilian phenomenon it's a more general latin american phenomenon if i understand uh, how does this sit with the, with the left particularly the far left like the venezuela or the atheist left in cuba for example or, or, i don't know what the left oh, is in the rest of uh, oh yeah I, I don't know about cuba yeah. but in venezuela you know that the the the, the catholic church even being more left side in these last three dec decades, it collapsed. It, it, it collided against the, the, the regime in Venezuela because the regime is too left, is going too far on the left, and even the left bishops uh, and Catholic Church in, in, in Venezuela couldn't go along with them. And the Pente new Pentecostal or evangelical denominations in Venezuela, I do believe that is. Uh, I, I, I believe that they have more Catholic orientation. But, you know, Venezuela is, is, is a, a, an example that we cannot understand. Uh, imagine uh, that a South America country, that the, the, the favorite sports is baseball, is not football, soccer. This country is an exp uh, it's impossible to understand. Only Venezuela is really a, an American... Uh, 50 second state because uh, how come uh, South America country has baseball and the second sports is box is not even football football I think it's the fourth one so Venezuela is an um, is much more an unknowing case than Brazil as, as pointed professor Miller 
uh, the only thing that explains Venezuela is the, the oil to provide to US and they rule Venezuela as they want. Even though uh, they don't have this, uh, this American influence on, religious, on, on religion as we had here with the evangelical influence, I think Venezuela is, is more Catholic oriented than Brazil in this sense. Not, it's, they are not like um, half of population like in Rio or in other cities in Brazil that the, the evangelical already are more than 50%. And the Venezuela case, Venezuelan case, I, 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 I can't explain if, 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 if I'm wrong, if, if, if there is new numbers that um, contradict what I'm saying here. But so far, I, uh, the last time I checked, they, they still more Catholic orient, oriented than the rest of us. But it's, if you go to, to Latin America, the, the, the evangelical Brazil, uh, that, I, that I told that to own the, the, the 30 TV network in Brazil, the, the, the largest one of, of the largest one, they have uh, churches in Africa, whole, all, all Latin American country. They grow so fast. They, they have in Portugal and in Italy. So they are growing in the world. And the name, the name of this is, 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 is some funny because it's uh, Igreja Universal, and Universal <laughs> is Catholic in Latin, so uh, it's, it's, they, they are growing in, uh, all over the world, but it's a Brazilian uh, export product. To our experts on Brazil, and um, how do you see possible uh, secession movements, especially regards uh, Brazil's strong ethnical diversity and its easy money problem? And then the second question to Care and maybe to Cristiano as well. So do you see a possible opposite inquisition? So an inquisition of original Catholicism, especially regards radical changes done by the current Pope? Um, the last question, do you see a possible opposite inquisition? So an inquisition of original Catholicism, especially regards radical uh, changes uh, uh, done by the current Pope? You know, it's, 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 uh, there, there is some Catholic Catholics that says that the, the next pope will, will be the the African one. What's his name? Sara. Yeah, it it would be a, 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 a radical change inside the church. The Brazilian uh, the Brazilian uh, elite Catholic elite and the, the bishops of Brazil and they are they are very close to to, to Francis. Francis uh, was in the, the, the Ceylon, which is Latin America reunion of the bishops, and they are all, this, they have the same orientation. There is some focus of, of more conservative Catholicism uh, in Brazil. Uh, the deeper Brazil is still very Catholic with our traditional uh, different rituals, uh, a different kind of Catholicism in each part of Brazil, in different parts of Brazil. And, but yes, uh, you know, Tom Woods has, has, has a, a profound uh, task that he, he launched to, our, to, to us Catholics, that is to, to teach, teach economics to the Catholic Church again to recover our, our great tradition. And, uh, and one of the things that I most love, uh, one of the articles that uh, I most love in, in my life was that Rothbard, Rothbard articles, article that he points the difference between Catholic uh, way of economics and the Protestant way of economics. And he points that, that capitalism is, is much more a Catholic thing. And uh, as I told to, to, to Professor Husman, there is no such thing as a German cigar, because we 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 produce things to enjoy it, different from the Protestant side that produce by because they have to work and work and work. And yes, it's it's in our cultural roots. Sometimes it will it has to to, to come back. Uh, somehow it has to come back because it's it's much more natural against this unnatural democratic uh, 
Republican system and uh, end up and and now going uh, about your first question about separatism it has uh, it's, it's linked to this and and as we go into uh, to, to 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 searching our locality in ident identity uh, uh, brazil has uh, everything to be different countries as the actor pointed in in the video i showed uh, it was. It is a different country. Each part of Brazil, only uh, united uh, for because the television power. Uh, but but you know when when you treat about uh, secession, it's always like uh, oh the north is rich and they won't get the, in Italy. The north is rich and they won't get rid of the, this poor South Napolitans, uh, the, the, these lame people. But it's the opposite. The secession would be much more uh, would do better to the poorest in Brazil in the northeast why 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 the, the people in in professor anthony miller's state doesn't have a job and are obligated to buy uh, a very lousy car paying uh, an extremely expensive price just to please the the industrials in sao paulo state so if they are free to buy whatever they want, the industrialists and the power syndicates in, in Sao Paulo that would, su would suffer more than anything. If Sao Paulo loses, wh why Sao Paulo benefits from this insane uh, transfer of money inside Brazil? Because the strong industrialists and the strong syndicates in, in south of Brazil benefits because they have a continent to sell the, the, their, their products. That's Brazil. Uh, the whole, the, the rest of the Brazil are obligated to buy from São Paulo industry. That's why the the, the elites and the oligopolized industries uh, don't don't care about being about São Paulo being more taxed than the rest of the Brazil because the money that they pay from the central government gets back in in in, in purchasing from the rest of Brazil. So it's a system very very tough to. To break and the fight is not the state against state, it's inside Sao Paulo state because the middle class pays this bill and suffers this this unproductive system. So I don't know if I'm if I if if, if you want to, to point is there any separatist movement? Yes, mainly in the south. Sao Paulo had its history because the biggest revolution, secessionist revolution happens in Sao Paulo state in '32, and Vargas crushed it. But uh, we are different people in Brazil. Uh, the, the Sao Paulo people are different from the Northeast people, from the North, from the Amazon, from the center. Uh, and, and Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, it's, uh, it's, it's even another language. I can't understand what Carioca is uh, speaking. And we are... The culture is not a... a, a a fixed thing. I think it's ev ev evolutes and, and changes according to the influence it's, it's going. And now it's a new cult cultural people every place in Brazil. I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm clear, but uh, Brazilian people are different in, ev in very different states. So I thank the panelists very much. I thank you all. <laughs> See you later.